Okay, welcome back to Decrypted Tech. Today we've got the Z87 Expert Board from ASUS up on the bench. We're going to take a look at some of the features and functions and everything like that. We've already kind of covered the box in our written review, which is right below this video down at the bottom. So if you click on that link, it'll take you into the written review where we introduce the design and the features. But taking a quick look, you can see uh, one of the big highlights here is going to be, of course, Thunderbolt. ASUS is including Thunderbolt on their uh, Z87 chipset. Uh, this is Intel's new connectivity. It gives you quite a bit, uh, 10 gigabits uh, per second of information transfer back and forth. So we'll flip the box over here real quick and take a look at the back. And again, the big highlight is, of course, Thunderbolt. Um, it shows you all that information. They're dual intelligent processors with four-way optimization. Wi-Fi Go, which is, of course, a big push uh, from ASUS. They have their Wi-Fi... Uh, the, the basically a wireless car, but it gives you extra options that you can use your PC to do different things such as share media, uh, you can control it remotely using your smartphone, view it remotely using a tablet, all of those things are all built into this Wi-Fi Go uh, feature. And we'll talk about that more once we get into the performance side of the uh, the review. But basically, I mean it's a pretty clean box, you get a picture of the, the board and the accessory, and alright, now we'll move on to what's actually inside the box. Okay, now that we're looking inside the box, first thing we find is, of course, a manual. That's always important. And then, of course, you have a couple of other manuals here. You have just a multilingual, uh, basically a pamphlet that explains everything to you. This is a quick shortcut to show you the motherboard layout and stuff that you would normally search through the manual for. You also have another uh, manual here that just talks about the individual features. So it'll t tell you about the uh, dual intelligent processors 4, Wi-Fi Go card, and, of course, Wi-Fi Go. You have a wireless antenna, which we'll pull out here in just a minute. You have four um, SATA, two, uh, SATA 3 cables. These are a little bit higher end. They look a little bit cleaner. Of course, you have the typical uh, I.O. shield. There is one SLI connector here. Of course, you have ASUS's uh, Q connectors. These are nice. Just lets you quickly set up the front end and USB connectors. And, of course, as always, you have a driver's DVD and the typical ASUS uh, sticker inside there. All right, now talking about this antenna, let's go ahead and open this up real quick. Now, in the past, the antennas that have been shipped with boards have been these round, kind of ugly things with a little pop-up antenna in the center. They're magnetic, and, and that's all well and good, but they, they're not attractive. ASUS decided to go with something a little bit more um, aesthetically pleasing, and of course all you do is you turn this around, and then it can sit on a desk once you get the cable arranged and it looks a little bit better than what they had before. I mean, it's not you know, completely great looking, but it is better looking than those generic white ones that we see in everybody else's motherboards. So, of course, it is a dual antenna, which is nice. It's gonna get you closer to that 450 megabits you can get on most uh, 802.11n routers. Um, it's not gonna be 802.11ac, unfortunately, yet. Uh, we're not gonna see that for a little bit on PC motherboards. But it's still a, a nice option and nice feature. And again, we'll talk about that more in our review. Now let's take a look at the motherboard. Okay, and we're back. Here's the motherboard. It is an ATX layout, so it has all of the design features that comes with the generic ATX board. It also got some of the same general flaws that come in the ATX design. As, uh, as motherboards become more complicated, they move faster, more traces, uh, increased pin count on DDR, you're going to see this particular design layout become more and more complex and it's going to create an issue. However, that having been said, there are already new trace layout designs such as uh, that I believe it's called T5000, which is a trace layout that's supposed to allow us to get up to 5 gigahertz in memory speed. So we got a little bit of headroom according to Intel and most of the manufacturing partners. The ATX design is here to stay at least for the foreseeable future and there really isn't anything that they can talk about on the horizon that's going to replace it. So let's dive in and take a look at some of the, uh, the features and be more specific about the board. All right, as with every ATX board, the upper half is going to be responsible for the CPU and memory. It's also going to be where your power inputs come in, uh, both the full 24-pin ATX and the 8-pin auxiliary. You're going to have your power controls for your CPU. Those are going to be covered by some sort of heat sink. Um, in the smaller boards where you don't have the dual banks of memory like you do on a, an X79 chipset, you're going to see that form an L shape around the CPU. It's supposed to allow cleaner airflow through to keep it cooler. Um, it also allows heat uh, to rise up this way. ASUS does a pretty good job here. They've chosen to go with a gold heat sinks, which is kind of interesting. I know one of the reasons they did that was to differentiate themselves 
from some of their competition. However, you know, we, we get a look that kind of re reminds of a, us of ECS, um, some of the other Foxconn boards. So it, it didn't really differentiate ASUS that much as it did uh, just kind of make it look a little bit cheesy um, in our opinion. You know, other people have said they like it. Personally, I kind of like the, the black and the dark blue that ASUS was moving towards. I think it gave it a much cleaner look, even though it might have been closer to one of their direct competitors. All right, moving around, we see one four pin fan header. There's another one right here below the uh, ATX power connector and, and the USB 3.0 controller. And you have another four pin f uh, fan header as we move around. <clears throat> you got your voltage regulation, and of course, this is for CPU here. And then you have your awkwardly placed 8 pin auxiliary power connector. This is every single board, every single ATX board. It's not an ASUS flaw. It's not ASUS's fault. This is just where it goes. And unfortunately, when you start plugging things in, they put the clip on the inside, your fingers are automatically going to hit this. We recommend they sell them out there. Just get the extension, plug it in before you put it in there. It also lets you do a little bit more cable management and get things cleaner. You know, it's just a, it's a fact of life. And if you have more than one, then they're all also going to be up here. Swinging the board around a little bit more, we'll take a look at the peripherals. Okay, and on here you have three X16 mechanical slots and four X1 slots. The X1 slots are X1 mechanical, X1 uh, electrical, so that's all well and good. There is only one X1, uh, X16 electrical slot up here. This is also PCIe Generation 3. These two down here, they're X8. They're not going to be any more than X8. They only have the pinout for X8, so if you're running SLI, you know, you could run it down here in these two, you're going to get X8, and that's pretty much going to be it. And we can show you that here. We'll flip the board over real quick. And as you can see, you have your one X16 pinout, and then you have your X8 pinouts, and of course your X1. <coughs> All right, flipping the board back over. From the design, it looks like ASUS intends you to use SLI here, using Generation 2, uh, the you know, SLI connector, the, the bridge that's here seems to indicate this as opposed to the distance between this and let you know these two slots here so this is going to be for generation three this is going to be for SLI again that's not hundred percent stated anywhere in the manual but that appears to be the intention that they want you could technically it looks like you could do three-way SLI although I, I doubt it would work all that well so we wouldn't recommend it along the bottom you have your usual audio front panel out trusted platform module although most people don't use trusted platform module you can buy them <clears throat> Uh, they're not that expensive, but realistically, there's no real reason to get into that. You have an onboard power button, Q code. Here you have BIOS flashback and direct key. These are actually two pretty cool features. If you've ever <coughs> bought a board, excuse me, and it didn't support the CPU you purchased as well. If you've ever done that in the past, you know what a headache that is. You end up in a situation where you're either borrowing somebody's older CPU or trying to find a way to get your board up to the BIOS that supports the CPU that you have. With this button, it takes all of that out of the way. As long as you have a properly formatted USB key and a power supply, you can actually flash the BIOS on this with this button. <coughs> this will let you go ahead, pop in your USB key, power it up, push this button. You don't have to have CPU in here, no memory, no nothing. Just pop that USB key in there and it's going to flash the BIOS to that new BIOS version that's on that USB key. It's a great feature. Um, ASUS is one of the first people to have it out there. So it's a really nice uh, feature to have, especially as you move forward and new CPUs come out that might not be supported by your system. New memory speeds come out that might not be supported by the system. So this is going to give you that option to just quickly get back up and running without any issues. Right next to it, the BIOS Direct Key. This is great. If you, uh, as you've noticed, a lot of boards are actually moving towards USB 3. You plug in a USB 3 keyboard because it's not running native. It has to load a driver of some sort. That keyboard might not initialize until the USB driver stack starts initializing. If that happens, you can't get into the BIOS. Hitting the, the delete key isn't going to work if the keyboard's not actually live. With this button, you can get straight into the BIOS. You do have to open up the side of the case or use it on an open test bench, but it's still there to get you in, get you running, get you going quickly. Right next to that, you have four USB 2.0 uh, headers. You have another four pin fan header. You have your front panel out, your EPU switch. The EPU switch has two settings. In its default setting, which you can see right here, that's going to be disabled. That means the system is not going to try 
and manually or automatically tune your settings to make sure that everything's running the way that the board feels is going to be best. That's your default setting. Over here, uh, if you do switch it to the other side, it's going to automatically choose your settings and try and give you the best energy efficiency. That's a great setting if you're building a small desktop workstation um, and you don't really intend to overclock it or do anything with it and you want it to be as energy efficient as possible. So go ahead and flip it that way, otherwise leave it at default which is disabled. Right next to it is the TPU switch. You have two settings here as well. One is setting one, which is uh, CPU boost, so that boosts the you know CPU performance and the other the one next to it is B clock and ratio. So these are two different modes that you can use when you're overclocking. The default is uh, setting one, which is the CPU boost. You can flip it over to two and that's going to give you your B clock and your ratio boost. All right, rotating around a little bit more. We'll kind of pull back here just a bit. You see that you have six SATA 3.0, and then of course you also have a SATA um, another SATA 3.0 here. This one's going to be run off of their AS Media, and these are run natively from the Z uh, Z87 chipset, which was right here back in this large and uh, you know again gold heatsink. It's kind of flat. Uh, fortunately, the Z87 doesn't produce a whole lot of heat, so this is going to be sufficient, especially if you have a video card that's going to pull some air across here, or you have good front uh, ventilation that moves back across the board. So that covers a lot of what we've got going on as far as just the overall layout. Uh, as you can see, all of the caps are Nichicon solid capacitors, which is another thing that ASUS has been pushing for for a while. They've been moving this down from their upper end boards, such as the Republic of Gamers boards, down into the uh, channel boards and into their, not really entry level boards, but just into their major lineup for their motherboards. All right, now we're gonna flip around here. We're gonna take a look at the I.O. panel. The I.O. panel is important because this is where you plug everything in. Uh, as is kind of standard, you get a combination PS2 uh, port. It'll do keyboard or mouse. You get a bunch of USB 3.0 ports, which is where that BIOS direct key comes in handy. You get HDMI, DVI, uh, looks like DVI-D, regular VGA out, which is kind of unusual, but still a nice feature. You have an Intel LAN card, which again, ASUS has been pushing for that. And then, of course, you have your normal 8-channel audio. Right next to it, down here, along the edge of the board, is, of course, that Thunderbolt adapter. That's that 10 gigabit per second uh, connection. That's really going to get you that high bandwidth. You can string up to six devices, daisy chain those. It's going to be great for storage, great for audio input, as well as for... In the future, you, uh, you'll be able to run 4K direct out to monitors using that particular connector. So that covers the design and layout and the, sort of the feature set, the basic feature set of the ASUS Z87 Expert motherboard. We're going to dive into performance here in just a little bit, so we'll be able to show you that, show you some of the software as it runs on the motherboard, and give you an overview of just how this performs running a, an Intel Core i7-4770K. As always, if you like this video, be sure to give the like button a click. Uh, make sure you share it with your friends and be sure to subscribe to us so you can stay up to date with the news and reviews we have for you. Thank you.